Straight ahead on Virginia Outdoor Life, get set to experience peer pressure. We'll teach you all you need to know to catch your dinner on one of the area's fishing piers. Plus, believe it or not, this fish is made out of wood. We'll introduce you to the artist who carved it. Time to relax and enjoy as we take you to the great outdoors on Virginia Outdoor Life, next. Hi, and how are you? Welcome to the show. This is Virginia Outdoor Live for Saturday, May 10th, along with the captain, Eric Burnley. I'm Bob Matthews. We're here at the Virginia Beach Fishing Pier. We're going to go out on the pier in just a few minutes and try our luck, because this time of the year is when the action really starts to heat up in places like this. The water gets warm, about 60 degrees, and the croaker and the spot, sea mullet, you get a lot of fish moving up, maybe some blues. So it's a good time of the year to be fishing on the piers. And it's pretty good value too. You know, you don't have to it's gas up a boat or nope. anything like that, right? What are the what are the, what are the rates usually run down here at the? I ocean think it's front? five dollars. We'll check it when we get out there. But it's it's very inexpensive. The uh, Virginia Beach uh, uh, fishing pier down in in Sandbridge is two dollars. That's mm -hmm. a city owned pier. You know, all the other piers are private. There's this one. There's Lynn Haven, Grandview, Buckrow. Several piers up in, within the viewing area where people can go out, James River Pier, right. and uh, enjoy the day for a very little investment in time or money. Right. Okay. Hey, time's a waste. Let's, let's go, go. Let's go get them. Okay, we're here at the Virginia Beach Fishing Pier with Jeff Neal. Jeff, how you doing? Good, good. Uh, Jeff, why don't you kind of run down, this is sort of a basic tackle uh, lineup that folks might use if they were fishing out here on the pier this right. time of year? Uh, standard rig is a double bottom rig that you can put two hooks on right. and then your sinker attaches to the bottom so that uh, one hook's a little bit higher up than the other, not quite on the bottom. Number four hooks. Number four hooks are the most popular. Uh, Sometimes we'll switch to a little bit bigger hook if we're getting a bigger fish. Right, but this time of year it's pretty much small Normally stuff. it's round heads, spots, croakers, and that hook's plenty for them. Right, and then you have the, the, the blood baits, worm's probably the best bait, when you think? Blood worms all the time out here uh, right. for the fish we catch. You cut them up in pieces, though. You don't use the whole worm. Oh, yeah, right. And then the squid is our second choice. The same thing, cut in strips. Okay, and how much is it to get on the pier today? Uh, it's $5 for adults, half price under 12 Two fifty under right. 12 Right now we're open from 8 till 8 but we'll go 24 hours sometime in May. Okay, fine, thank you very much. Sure. I appreciate your help. No problem. All right, you got your bait set up here. What do we yeah. got, what are we gonna use? All right, first of all, we have the, the rod and reel that we're gonna use, and this is a very basic, anybody can get it anywhere. This one is older than I am. It's an old <laughs> Garcia reel. Man. It's an old rod, perfect for pier fishing. It's You don't want too long of a rod when you're fishing on the pier right. because of your restricted casting area and you hit people in the head and all like that. that. Would not be but good. you will see people out here with great big surf rods <laughs> that just not necessary. This is the rig that we picked up in the uh, in the tackle shop. Mm -hmm. I've put the two hooks on there, just loop them through this, loop them right through here. All right, now we want to bait them up. Now my favorite bait this time of year is a blood worm. We've taken the blood worm here and Whoop. we've cut him up into little pieces because number one that's all you need for these spot and croaker you don't need a big piece of bait and number two it's very expensive to buy a blood worm so you want to get as much bait out of him as possible the other bait that we bought was squid and i've taken the squid and cut it into strips okay just run it down there now when you cut bait you always want to use a very stiff knife you don't ever want to use a fillet knife to cut bait or you'll cut yourself so we just take that cut that into strips and then we'll probably just cut those strips in half now to put the blood worm on the hook, you want to thread it on the hook. You want to thread the blood worm on the hook. Very small hook, so all you need is a very small piece of blood worm. Right. So you just start out, you put the, the point of the hook in there, and you just run it right on up the whole hook. See the little bait holders here on the end of the hook? Right. Try to slide them right on up so that those bait holders will hold it. Okay. Keep it from sliding off. And then you leave the point exposed, okay? And there's your, there's that now. For our squid bait, all we do is we, we'll just cut that in half because we don't need that big of a piece. I feel like I'm watching the frugal gourmet here. Yes, and you just take the squid bait and hook it two or three times. These small fish have a small mouth and they'll nibble away. If you leave a piece of bait hanging off the end of the hook, mm -hmm. they'll nibble it right down to nothing. So now we're ready to fish. Always want to carry a rag with you, of course. There's two ways you can cast. I want to give me a little room here. I got you. A lot of people will start back here 
uh -huh. and they'll throw it out like that, all right? Well, that's fine, except that you get to do that, you get in the habit of that, somebody or a little kid goes walking by and it ain't a pretty sight. <laughs> you take it uh, with you. The best way to cast from a pier is to drop the line down like this, right. get it swinging, and just flick it. So you don't need it really, you're not looking for a 150 no. foot cast. You don't need any like long the... cast. Now, the, later in the summer, the king mackerel will start running. Uh, Spanish mackerel, we'll talk about that later. But for this type of fishing, and it's very difficult, you lay the rod, somebody's already gouged many, see all these little marks in here? Right. That's where people have gouged out a place for the rod to sit. You find yourself a nice seat that they provide <laughs> you with on the pier. Kick back and you relax. You sit huh? down, you lay back, and get your feet up like this, uh -huh. and you're pier fishing. All right, well, hey, this is easy. Doesn't I can do get this. any better than this, does it? Heck no. So what'd you catch? Oh, I caught a spot today. Nice, nice, nice yeah, size? Yeah, nice size. Um, they're running kind of small, though, in the beginning, but uh, they're coming out pretty good round heads today. Can we see it? Yeah, sure you can. Let's see if I can get him for it. That going to fry up okay? Yeah, in the pan. <laughs> <Very> nice. <laughs> well, it's just a good place to fish and, and it's, uh, it's a nice way to relax. Good way to spend the day. Yeah, if you catch fish, all right. If you don't, it's still all right. <laughs> all right, pier fishing doesn't take a lot of fancy tackle. It's pretty basic stuff. Right. And one of the best ways to get your stuff out here is in a five gallon bucket. <laughs> now you want to carry a rag with you just to dry your hands off and dry the fish mung off your hands. You want to carry a good solid bait cutting knife, nice thick knife so you can cut your bait. Now these are called jerk jiggers or uh, gotcha lures and they're used for Spanish mackerel, king mackerel, bluefish. We'll show you how to use those in a little while. But you need a couple or three of those to have around. They're good lures for that type of fishing as is this whip tail. Mm -hmm. And then also the, uh, the rubber lures with the uh, little viber flash tail on them, different sizes of those. Okay, that's just for the speckled trout, gray trout, what have you. It uh, doesn't hurt to have a spool of leader material if you want to make up your own rigs. Right. Some spare rigs already tied up. Sinkers, different sizes, different shapes of sinkers. All of this will fall right into your bucket. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much all you need in there. Now, I always carry uh, this with me. That's got all kinds of hooks and snaps and swivels and all sorts of stuff like that. But you don't basically you don't really need that it's yeah. just you love my, variety it's so. my security blanket I i've understand. got to have that with me <laughs> and really that's all you need uh, this this particular pier supplies you with some nice seats other piers don't so you would want to bring a chair but basically that's all you really need to go pier fishing okay well we didn't catch much except a good case of windburn but as you said once the water temperatures heat up the fishing's going to get a lot better out here. oh yeah there'll be spot croaker be all kinds of stuff to catch in this summer and of course a lot of places to go to catch them we've got uh, the Buck Road Pier, the Grandview Pier, and the Lynn Haven Pier in the mm -hmm. bay. We have this pier in the ocean as well as the Little Island City Park Pier down in uh, Sandbridge and then of course the Outer Banks. Many, many piers along the Outer Banks for folks to go and enjoy this type of fishing. Good, easy, cheap way to do it. Absolutely true. Well, we didn't have a whole lot of luck here, but we know a place where we've got a sure thing cooking. We're going to take you out to Chesapeake for some fish when Virginia Outdoor Life returns at the ocean front. Back to the ocean front. We're here at the Virginia Beach Fishing Pier, and since we're talking about fishing, this is something that you brought to our attention a couple of months ago. You saw some of these fish carvings that we're about to show folks out at the shows, and they're fantastic, aren't they? They are. This it was a decoy show, but he was there with his fish, and I was really, really impressed with his work. Well, we decided to go on out to Chesapeake and take a tour of the shop and meet the man behind the fish. here all my life and I've always enjoyed the bird and duck carvings mm -hmm. uh, and I got the feeling that there was something people needed other than that uh, being one of the largest fishing areas in the world uh, why not be different and try something different and so it was started out as a, more as a hobby and just as something to do and we started selling them and people started asking more and more about them and uh, uh, now we've gotten into a full-time job after retirement and uh, <laughs> the um, 
fish are just taking off, more shows are starting to have fish carvings in it and uh, promoting the, the art itself. I really believe in the catch and release type thing. You know, take what you're going to, to use and put the rest back and people are not mounting fish like they did years ago and this is uh, you know a viable alternative to having a live fish mounted. It's something made by hand not by the man, hand of God you know and this way it can be passed down to their children and their great grandchildren. It'll be the same today as it is 50 years from now. Most of the fish I do here are native area fish like freshwater bluegill, the brim, uh, the bass. I do saltwater, uh, the redfish, and you know anything related to saltwater, speckled trout, and uh, things of that nature. Okay, well let's go inside the shop here see how you bring these things to life. Great. So this is where it all happens, right? Yep, this is my little little hole in the ball. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well what do you, when you, when you first start a carving, how do you start? Uh, it begins with a uh, large block of tupelo, which I use for carving, and the tupelo comes from the swamps in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the old black gum tree, what they call the black gum tree, and they right. use the base of the tree. And uh, I design a pattern, and uh, I, the pattern is, is put onto the tupelo and traced out. And then it's roughed out on a bandsaw, and I also have a top design of general shape of the fish that I want it to be. Right. And it's cut out on the bandsaw, which leaves me a rough pattern, and then I go my sander and re remove a lot of the excess material. And you do all that by hand? Mm -hmm. It's all done by hand, yes. And then what I don't do that, I take my knives or chisels and get the final shape. So how long does it take you from the block stage to right here? How long does this take? Oh, that's not, that, that's, that, probably, that, that's, that's probably part. two or three hours. Yeah, oh, okay, that's, so that's the easy yeah. part. And then uh, once you get from there, you, uh, I start getting the final sanding done and start doing the, the facial details. Mm -hmm. uh, where the, you put the eyes in and, and get all the faces and then I start with the scaling which really takes most of your effort. Originally when I did it I, I used to draw everyone individually by hand but I have developed since then a one-step process where I make my own tips uh, to burn them in, right. in the burning process. Is that how you did it? It's done with like a, with like a yes, burning? Yes, it's done with a burning, uh, burning tip that I, I make out of, uh, I make them out of nails, believe it or not. Oh man. Instead of buying them, I've, I've had to produce my own so I can produce any size scale that I need hmm. and uh, it's threaded in and uh, I produce and use it as a burning technique to, to do the scales. Right. Everything is relieved. That membrane is actually relieved from the portions here. Right. And then all the veins are, are burned in. And the fins are all inserted except for the tail fin. Mm -hmm. They're all done on an insert basis. And then once he's done this, I seal it, I seal it with a, uh, a lacquer sealer, and then uh, the painting process begins. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it, it just, it must take, I can't imagine the amount of patience it must take to put it, all those scales in. It takes a long time. Uh, that's, like I said, that is the biggest portion of my time is doing the scales, because if, if you mess the scales up, or it, it jumps right out at you. It's like oh. a, a, a mar in a piece of wood or paint. You can see it, it comes right out at you. So what, what happens when you mess off? I used to throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Have you ever gotten to the point where you're like right down? Oh yes, and oh yes, many times. Yeah. Oh, I just, man. just use it for firewood. <laughs> Well, Will, I know you don't display them out here, but this, this is a good place to show how, the, how all the, the everything catches the sunlight. These are some of your favorite pieces. Yes, right? these, these are some of the ones uh, we've completed recently. Uh, the catfish seems to be a, a, one of the f uh, show favorites for some reason. Everybody likes it as ugly as he is. They still <laughs> seem to enjoy it. But this will give you an idea of you know the detailing, uh, the scales and the painting, and the rocks were all done, and uh, of course the grass and the minnows were all carved. Yeah. Uh, now, now, I mean, and, and everything here is wood, right? The rocks, the yes, rocks sir. are wood. The, yes, the, the, the everything in in the display. The is The sand. I make my own sand. Also, I don't use real sand anymore. I make my own sand. <laughs> Uh, and the bases are all, you know, I do all the, I try to have control over the whole piece when I can. Right. Uh, it gives it uh, more, more personal appeal to me to be able to control all of what you do in nature. I like this especially because this really gives you kind of an idea of, of where you go from. And this, this you say you use as your demonstration, Yes, right? we give this as a, as a demo piece. To get, most people see a finished product and they always ask you, where do you start? Mm -hmm. And this, I, you know, left half of them undone and did the uh, features a little larger than I normally would to give them an idea of what they look like. That is just amazing. And of course, one of the most popular items for the show, probably because it's a little less pricey, for about 55 bucks, you can pick up one of these pins, right? Yes, those are uh, detailed to the same uh, proportion as the large pieces. I do every scale, mm -hmm. uh, the fins are all done the same, and it's carved out of uh, American holly. Well, Will, thanks for showing us everything. Where can people catch you in the next uh, few weeks or so? You going to be at any shows? No shows coming up recently. They can catch me at my home here. That's my, where I do my shop and do all my work, and they can find me there. Okay. Be there carving. Now, if you want to get some of this stuff, there's the number. Just give them a call out in Chesapeake, and uh, 
I guarantee he'll set you up. And you were saying you've been out to the shows and seen some of his work there, and it's just it's spectacular. Absolutely. And you were right. It, 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 is, it looks like it's still wet. Yeah, that's the amazing part about it. Beautiful work. It really is. Well, we got to take a break. When we come back, though, it is time to open up the scrapbook. Picture time as Virginia Outdoor Life rolls on from the oceanfront. Welcome back to the show. We are here at Pierside at Ocean Eddie's. Now, if you want to grab a bite after uh, doing a little fishing, this is a good, That's right there. good a spot for it is any. The catch of the day in case you don't catch one today. Exactly. <laughs> All right, time to open up the outdoor scrapbook. I know you've been waiting for it. So the actual pictures sent in by actual viewers. And we are going to start with my friend. All righty, this is Carrie Lafanaire, I believe, and Jeff Lindsay. Uh, they're from Newport News. Uh, Carrie had a 41 inch, 27 pound striper, and Ron a 32 inch, 22 pound striper. They're a brother and sister surf fishing team. They caught these two big stripers within a half an hour of each other, fishing oh, nice. in Hatteras last February, and I am insanely jealous. That's pretty good luck, huh? Luck, Catching that's two skill with when you get a fish like that. Those are gorgeous fish. Okay, Skip Byrne of Manio, North Carolina. There's some big stripers right here, some big old stripers yes, caught near are. the Bodie Island Lighthouse area. His wife Gail sent in the picture. She says she's very proud of him. I imagine she has is. has good reason to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those are gorgeous. And here we have two lovely young ladies, Brittany and Megan Bessier. And they're from Virginia Beach. They have a couple of big rock, or have a big rock fish there that uh, they were fishing with their grandparents this past December out of Rudy Inlet. And proud Grandpa Frank sent in the picture. Beautiful or is, fish. Or is it spelled on our script pro ad? Grandpa. Yes. <laughs> but we digress. Jennifer McKinney of Chesapeake, a 35 inch striper caught last December. Jennifer is a vice president of Chesapeake Bay uh, Treble Hookers. And this was the biggest striper caught by a club member in 1996. So I imagine Jennifer has her name on a plaque somewhere. I would if I had she to does. guess. And well earned. Yes. All right, here we have Randy McKeeneth. McKeithen. McKeithen, I think. McKeithen, that sounds right. Let's good. try that again. Yeah. All right. Here we have Randy McKeithen of Chesapeake. He's eight years old, and he caught this big catfish. Uh, near the Kerr Lake Dam. He caught it last July, and his mom, Kim, sent in the picture, and is that a happy, smiling face or what? That's I fantastic. I would say so. Yes, indeed. Thank Welcome back to the ocean front. Time for a hot product, and since we've got a few days of turkey season left, we thought we'd give away a couple of more turkey calls. We've got a raspy double hook and a clear hook from Primos, and uh, since we don't want to take them out of the package and ruin them for whoever's about to win them, that's right. And you want to know more about it? Then, well, take a look at this. And there you have it. And depending on your level of skill, I guess you might be able to call them that well. So you let's might. pick yeah. us out a winner and see who's going to get to. Okay, we dun, have... Dun, 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 drum roll, please. Right, this is from Donald Wayne Wood Jr. And he was concerned about the tuna segment we did where we left the hook inside of the fish's mouth. These are called tuna circle hooks, and they are round, and they, when they pull through the fish's mouth, the round end is inside, so you get no damage inside of the mouth. When the fish reaches the corner or latch of the mouth, it hooks the fish, you play him out, and then you cut the line and leave the hook in. Now, either that hook will rattle around and fall out, or it will may stay in on rare occasions. When it does, it has no effect on the fish. We have captured fish two and three years later with the hook still in them, no apparent ill effects whatsoever. So it doesn't hurt him if he wants to feed, and it there doesn't no, provide any, no, any kind of bacteria nothing, infections. Nothing. Well, the weather should be getting better every day. The water warming up. We ought to be seeing some nice bluefish, uh, perhaps offshore, some sea mullet and spot and croaker on the piers. Flounder fishing should really start to turn on. So we're really looking at some improved fishing all along. Okay, hey, weather's warming up. Going to be a great weekend. Go out and have a good one. And we'll see you back here next Saturday. He's Eric Burnley. I'm Bob Bain. Y'all take them easy. Hold this, open that up. It's open now. Take your finger and hold it on. Put your little finger back here and then you can hold it. 